Hi, everyone, and welcome to The X, a podcast from inside Silicon Valley about how experience shapes everything from products to businesses to entire industries. I'm Brian McLean, and I'm here with Demetrius Madrigal. Today, we're going to be talking about chips and processors. Yay. After many years focusing on mobile processors, <laughs> Qualcomm is releasing Snapdragon processors for laptops, and they seem to be poised to make a real splash. So we thought we would do a quick podcast about this as Demetrius dug in, and he's going to explain it even to me about what the heck is going on. So D, why did you bring this to my attention? So I first noticed this, uh, I, I was looking at a new old, for a new Ultrabook. I've got a gaming laptop and that's great, but I was like, eh, it's a little bit big and heavy and and, uh, and hot because <laughs> it has yeah. a fancy <laughs> Uh, so I was like, oh, well, let's see what's out there. So I looked at the Microsoft Surface and I noticed that they were only available with uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon processors. You cannot buy the new uh, generation of Microsoft Surface with an Intel or AMD processor. Okay. So I Interesting. Looking at it a little bit more, and these were for pre order, right? Uh, and it turns out that these are from the ground up processors built for, uh, for AI. And for integrating ChatGPT's version, uh, Microsoft version, which is called Copilot. Okay. So uh, they are going to be available June 18th, which will probably be, uh, they'll be available by the time that I think that this podcast gets published. But they're being integrated into uh, Microsoft Surface laptops, HP laptops, Samsung, Lenovo, plenty of others. Okay, let me pause you right there. So why is it that you were kind of like, oh, they're all using Qualcomm Snapdragon chips in them? Like, what was it that kind of caught your attention that made you get a little curious and dig into this? So, number one, Qualcomm has been doing done a great job for a long time at uh, mobile processors. They are kind of the the um, they are the name of the game in mobile processors. And Apple and Google have designed their own chips. They don't necessarily make them themselves, but they've designed them and then. You know, TSMC makes them. Uh, but the for Qualcomm to now cross over from mobile and into uh, desktop applications was uh -huh. they had to have something in mind. And for now, for Microsoft, which is you know investing heavily in these uh, AI capabilities with uh, ChatGPT and Copilot and all these things. For them to exclusively pick those, it, it indicated to me that there was really something there. So I, I, I watched a video on this, and mm -hmm. one of the reviewers on there was incredibly excited about what was going on um, because apparently these chips have like massively like leaped over from a performance standpoint, yeah. uh, AMD and Intel. Now, how did yeah. AMD and Intel let this happen? So here, here's the thing a little bit. I noticed when every time with every processor releases that it, it's it's kind of like uh, NFL quarterback contracts. The most recent one is going to be the best one. Mm, okay. So, but the interesting thing about this is that it is so far leaps and bounds ahead of um, nearly every processor on the market right now. It is kind of shocking. So let me run you through a little bit, a little bit of the, the okay. stats that we know from announced stats. These aren't actually... Well, we do have some Geekbench stats, but um, we need to see how this actually performs in the wild. Uh, so that's a little bit of a caveat. So the performance uh, has been rated on par with Apple's M3 chip and beating flagships. Uh, this is for traditional uh, processing. We're not getting into the uh, to the NPU yet. Okay. But just for the the CPU and the, the SOC, uh, it beats the M3 on multi-threaded tasks. Uh, loses slightly on single threaded tasks, but it, it absolutely trounces AMD and, and Intel's most recent. What does chips, that actually so. mean, though? Like a multi threaded versus a single threaded? Like, so what are single we single threaded tasks into? are going to be like focused single tasks, things like uh, heavy, processor heavy things like gaming, maybe video processing, things like that, where it's okay. like, all right, well, we're, we're going to let this thing be focused and do one thing. Multi-threaded is obviously uh, things that you know, you're multitasking. You're you're doing one thing while you're doing another. You're you know you're watching a YouTube video while you're uh, while you're uh, taking notes in a word processor, that kind of thing. So okay. it, it's it's ahead, and which is on its own is kind of expected for the newest release. But it's the rest of the different factors in combination with this that are 
what makes it ultimately compelling. Okay. So one of those is that it is claiming 26 hours of battery life. That's insane. Uh, it is. Now, well, the thing is that's claimed and it's never turns out to be what's claimed, right? So I yeah. think the caveat they said is like, oh, this is playing a video for that is not coming from the internet. It's housed locally and I'm sure it has certain settings on it in order to achieve that number. Mm-hmm. But for context, uh, the uh, 14-inch M3 MacBook Pro claims 22 and has mm-hmm. been tested at 19. The- yeah, and, and I can I can tell you, f- because that's what I have, um, is, mm-hmm. I think I have that exact MacBook Pro, uh, I can run it, I, don't, I haven't done 19 hours, but I could basically run it from the morning when I get up, Yeah, let's say six o'clock in the morning, and I can run it all the way until night and still not plug it in with all of the work that we do. Yeah, I think that, you know, anything over, I mean, 12 is really, I think, the magic number. If you can run it for 12 hours without without having to plug it in, yep. that's, I think at that point, it's where you, you get really functional as far as like, okay, now I can use this all day long and not have to worry about battery. Yeah, super cool. Plug it in while I'm sleeping, right? Um, 26, anything above that I think is a nice to have. Uh, why this matters for a Windows machine is that these are, this is unprecedented territory for a Windows machine. Uh, MacBook Pros have been able to do this um, for a while, and they have been using a bunch of different uh, kind of optimization strategies in order to get there that they, they're able to do because of the integration with the OS. Uh, but for Qualcomm to do that now, so now we're talking about a processor that outperforms uh, almost every chip out there, except for M3 on uh, on single threaded tasks, also has battery battery life. And now the next point, uh, it claims 45 million tr- or excuse me, 45 trillion operations per second. So that's tops for the neural processing unit, and that neural processing unit is what is used for uh, for AI integration. So on device okay. AI, not like cloud AI. So what you're saying is basically they're setting all of these things to be prepared for the future of heavy AI yeah. integration. So they're setting a new benchmark, um, and it's ground it's built ground up to be much more focused on AI. And that benchmark is a significant improvement over what we've seen before. And it's coming from a new player within this category. So all of that is just saying like, all right, well, everybody else, you got to keep up. So 45 trillions operations per second, that's compared to the M3s at 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's at more than double. Uh, so Intel is claiming that Lunar Lake could be 45 to 100. I, I've seen numbers up to 100, which could be crazy. So we'll see what actually that comes out with. And that's supposed to an- release at the end of the year, but it's not out now. Uh, and AMD is also claiming that they're going to have uh, a 50 trillion operations per section um, their NPU coming out sometime in this year also. But for the time being, at least, Qualcomm will lead the pack on AI uh, NPUs. Uh, so you're, you're basically to telling me. In addition to everything else. You're basically telling me that this is faster than my Pacific Bell 386 SX with a math coprocessor? Probably not. <laughs> no, no, absolutely yes. Uh, I don't even remember what that is. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would go into the store was, and they was would I say- Was I alive when that was made? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this was in the early 90s and you'd go into the okay. store and they would say, this one comes with a math coprocessor. And you're like, oh, yeah. that's yeah, amazing. This, this is going to beat your ColecoVision. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so on top of all of that, these PCs are coming out. Uh, you can get a Surface- uh, tab, uh, uh, laptop starting at $999. I mean, that's practically free compared, compared to buying a MacBook. Yes. <laughs> this is, that's nuts, right? So you're talking about something, this, this is disruption. We are seeing disruption happen at the processor level. So, uh, when you see something like this being disrupted at the processor level, then it's going to cause some ripple effects. And that's why I think it's not just that Qualcomm is bringing this out, but it's also how everybody else is going to respond. Well, this is really uh, good. This is really good because the, co- the competition is so important, right? It's like if if AMD's doing fifty uh, trillion yeah. operations and someone else is doing forty five, the next person's like, "I got to do sixty, and it, it's just all better for the consumer. Yeah. Well, you you pair that with the battery life. Yeah. 
Yeah. Also, and then and then you're you're competing on price. One of the nice things also is because they've been working very closely with with Microsoft and their Copilot pro, uh, program, they had some demos that I thought were really interesting. So you can take uh, you can take like a stick figure drawing and feed it to the AI and say, hey, this is what I want. This is how creative and realistic I want it to be, and it'll kick out an image for you. Uh, yeah, you know my 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 son uh, does that all the time on Canva. So Canva yeah. has it on their side where you can draw something and then it just creates it and you can just write cat and all this stuff. And then it just builds <laughs> these cool images and it's incredibly addicting. Like you just want to keep drawing things and trying things and stuff, but it's really impressive. I mean, that's not on yeah. the processor side of the machine that we mm-hmm. have. It's on the So that's been, yeah, been on cloud side. So that's kind of what we've been seeing with Sora and some things like that. So now this is on device, which is cool. Uh, one other thing, I mean, we've seen that before. Uh, it can do uh, for people like me who are into music. It can take a song and without kind of the 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 mix down of the song where it breaks it out into the different individual tracks so that you can take them out and That's awesome. uh, do remixes or like oh, I want to take the the drums out or add them back or put in different drums and things like that. It can take songs that are fully mixed and mastered and mix them down automatically. So it can say, okay, well, you have this song that just came out. You can go ahead and take out the drums. You can take out the vocals. You can do this or that and and just dynamically play with it where you can add in, all right, well, let's do a quick mashup by just doing this. You can do a live mashup rather than like all of the different production stuff that's been done with it. That's uh, awesome. Which is pretty cool. And I haven't seen that done yet. So that's a new thing. No, I mean, well, that takes a ton of processing power. So, mm-hmm. so this is this is all being set up so that we could do things that we've always wanted to do that we can't do. Yeah. I mean, there's other things in here. So they have live translation, which, you know, Google has been doing for quite a while, but it's available. It's on device and you don't necessarily have to go through Google if you don't want to. Uh, it has improved video editing. It seems pretty similar to Google's magic editor, uh, video and photo editing. So you can just say, Hey, this person in the background, just take them out and replace them with stuff or uh, do some color correction of everything except for the subject. You can do that kind of stuff on it. Um, there's a thing called Windows Recall on it. What is that? Um, so basically what you can do is it, it lets you kind of scrub backwards in what you've done on Windows over a period of time. Over the entire Windows? Yes. Everything that you've done, let's say in the past, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's like 48 hours or something like that. So if you were, um, if you were, like I imagine that this is a little bit more specific than just like a browser history things. And it's more global. So if you were, yeah. you know, if you were doing some calculations on a, a uh, spreadsheet or something like that, and you forgot to save it, you can scrub back through and see what it was. This is not good if you're a criminal and you get busted. No. So it is a little, uh, <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I kind of like, I saved it for last because it is the kind of thing where number one, it, I can't think of too many instances in which I would really want it. it. It's come up every now and then, but it's usually things like, Oh, back in like, you know, 2008, I was working on this thing and I lost the the documents. I'd like to mm. rush to get those back, but I don't think it's going to do things like that. But, uh, and people are worried about privacy and things like that, which something like this, like that means it's storing. Uh, I imagine it's storing on device. So it's a little bit less of a concern, but I don't know. There's always a cost benefit ratio, right? And the concern with privacy relative to the benefit you get out of it, I'm not sure if it's going to work out. But I also know that Windows, that Microsoft obsessively tests all this stuff. So um, they must have seen some data from users who looked at this and said, yes, I like this. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to wait to see what it's like when it actually comes out. Because yeah, it's not I mean, like it they've had 100, obviously. It sounds super exciting. I mean, like as boring as chips and processors are, and I'm mm-hmm. dead serious, like incredibly boring. <laughs> Um, you know, true story. A long time ago, somebody asked me if I was interested in an opportunity over at a uh, chip manufacturer company. And, mm-hmm. uh, I, I responded no before I even like looked into it. Well, um, I mean, a lot of, a lot of those chip because, processor companies, they yeah. do a lot of ethnography to figure out, okay, what are the emerging use cases that we need to be able to support? Totally. Totally. Yeah. One of those it, it, cases just, I think where that paid off. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think it's the, they're great and they, what they do is like so necessary and stuff like that. I joke because it's just like, it's the driest thing in Silicon Valley, but it's like the most important because nothing else can be done if we don't build processors and chips and boards, right? So, yes. and actually, 
uh, when I was in between jobs um, a very long time ago, I actually installed chips and boards uh, into computers in an assembly line for one full day. Um, and after doing <laughs> well, it for one full day. Well, that's going to your perception, dude. <laughs> yeah. And then after the, uh, one full day, I was like, all right, no thanks. <laughs> yeah. The assembly line experience is not going to, it, no matter what it is, it's not going to set you up for thinking <laughs> super fun Ex- and exciting. Exactly. I will say that based on these demos, I mean, this is one of the reasons why when we were talking about uh, about Apple's uh, I, AI, Apple intelligence uh, kind of features that they announced, yeah. I was like, really? This is it? I mean, you guys don't have a magic eraser yet, but like smart notifications? They do. So no, no. That was actually part of now. one of their announcements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is I that, that you, they, they could do... Um, yeah, you can like grab people, move them around. You can do that whole like 3D look. You can remove people from the background. You could do all that stuff now. Yeah. Okay, it's, cool. Everyone's meeting in the middle on that stuff. Yeah. And this is what happens and what should happen. So, uh, yeah, this is one of the things are like, I saw these and I was like, oh, these are things that I'm actually going to care about. Uh, now, uh, do you have any other thoughts and questions before we get into predictions on this kind of thing? Uh, I don't have any thoughts or questions, but I do have some predictions. Um, sure. Go for it. If you want me to go first. So this is what happened multiple times throughout the history of this, the PC kind of being released to people. And every single time you can kind of like look at the data and it, it kind of coincides with a massive growth of startup companies that are doing things that you can't even imagine yet. So whenever the, when the pipeline opened up for um, internet. So we went from like dial up to broadband. Suddenly you start seeing these amazing opportunities to do things like save all your files on someone else's server that is not on your computer and all these types of things. Um, the, when, uh, mobile and, uh, when mobile basically was released and at the same time we had the opportunity to have fast internet, suddenly Uber existed so what I'm predicting is, is that by getting these processors so incredibly fast and having the ability to do the things that you're describing, we are going to see a massive boom of startup companies doing things that our brains thought were not capable before with computing mm-hmm. and will soon be capable and will take our experiences with computers and smart devices and mobile devices and everything else to the next level. Like, like we're about to see a rocket ship take off and yes. I'm glad you like found this because I would have never seen this or even thought about this, honestly. But when you find these little slices like this, they could sometimes be a bit boring, but incredibly impactful. And I think our listeners can use this to help their brains kind of reframe what user experience is going to look like in the next five to 10 years. Yes. So I think this is, like I said before, this is disruption. I think it's pretty rare Within the processor space, honestly, like we always say it is use cases, not spec bumps. Yep. So, you know, something lighter, thinner, better battery life, that's all well and good. But when you can do something new that you couldn't do before, that's when things start to move. And we've been, you know, talking a little bit about inflection point when it comes to AI. I don't think that this is necessarily necessarily the inflection point, but this is the clearest sign that we are on the doorstep of it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And every no. single one of my biggest prediction is that all of these other uh, processor developments, developers, including uh, not just AMD and, and Intel, but also Apple, Samsung, and Google are going to have a fire lit under them. This is going to be the thing that, that, that stimulates change. And we're going to get into this movement forward. Um, and it also says to me that, all right, well, Microsoft is really going to be a competitor because I was looking at, I've been waiting for ChatGPT to go beyond just kind of the, the chatbot uh, thing and get to some integrations and start delivering some use cases. And this is the beginning of it. So I think we're, we're, we're ramping up for a slugfest. Oh, yeah. And this is the rebuilding of Microsoft. I mean, people see them as a massive big corporation, and they are, but like they are rebuilding the entire company around artificial intelligence, which is super exciting. And this is the quiet stuff in the background that is enabling that to occur. 
And yeah. so this is this is super exciting. Well, thanks for bringing this to my attention uh, and, one, and bringing one it up. One last question. I'm going yeah. to go a little crazy here, right? What do you think, based on what we're seeing here and what we're seeing about, about, about uh, Microsoft's investments, what do you think the chances are that we see a return of uh, Microsoft to the mobile phone space? Now, keep in mind that they have Surface tablets. They have tablet devices and they Surface OS. They've learned a lot over over the years. Mm. That's, man, I've never even thought about that. I just kind of, honestly, I kind of checked them off because I'm like, hey, look, you know, 100% of the market is covered by two people right now. Um, They waved the white flag, but this could bring them back. It could bring them back. You know, what's interesting is that uh, I saw a statistic that said the majority of all interactions that happen on a smartphone are not phone related. Yes. So they don't even need to create a phone. <laughs> they could just create <laughs> the ultimate device that happens to be smaller that doesn't make phone calls and probably well, yeah, take market share. It's a computing operating system and, and a phone, the, the actual phone dialer is like one little part of it. But, yeah, but I don't, um, I don't dial you on a regular phone. I dial yeah. you over Hangouts. Yeah. So why do you even need a phone if everybody's on Hangouts, right? So I, I do think, uh, I don't know. Honestly, D, you kind of threw one. Uh, off the top of my head, I would say that within, you know, three to five years of really dominating in the space. Do I think that they can now compete in that area? Absolutely. I think they could. Um, But I'd have to process this more because I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. And I kind of, like I said, I kind of put them aside as like, they just didn't make it happen. Kind of like Amazon, right? It's like, they just didn't make a phone. Um, They tried, but they didn't make it. They tried. They had the Fire Phone and I think they have Fire Devices. Um, I one of the things that they ran into is that they used Android as their backend, um, which is yeah. great because Android, you know, that's what Android is kind of for. It's it's open source, so people can use it and put it on whatever they're developing, um, and that's super helpful. But I and we have to be absolutely clear, we have absolutely no inside knowledge about any of this. So if it comes out, just you know, uh, this is not you know us uh, revealing anything. This is just us like being able to take a look at the market and say, huh, yeah. this would make sense. Absolutely. But can you imagine a Surface phone? I, I sure Yeah, can. I mean, totally. I mean, I, do I think that there should be more than two phones in the market? I do. I think it's really mm-hmm. hard because once people get like connected into an ecosystem, they don't want to leave it. But like, I feel like, yeah, there should be. I'd love to see like four of them. I'd love to see the ability to walk over and grab something completely different and it still has all the same features and you know, it drives well, down prices. At, if everybody at Twitter and Tesla can't bring their iOS devices into the, <laughs> into the, into work, then maybe they need another alternative. You know, there were there were theories that Tesla was going to start building its own phone called the Tesla phone. There were. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't think, think they are anywhere though. close to that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah that's a good question. It's something to marinate system. on. Um, yeah, something to, something to think about. Maybe we should talk about it again uh, in future podcasts as we kind of continue to think about what that landscape would look like if they did it. If it does happen, let me just tell you, I'm going to take the biggest victory lap you've ever seen. Oh, I know because it's such a far off prediction. It's basically saying, can, you know, someone come back from the dead where they, they lost, they basically lost Amazon I mean, and Microsoft lost this battle to yeah, the other companies. The reality is there's plenty of surface users out there. Uh huh. And if you just modify that operating, it's not cheap and it's not easy, but it's not nowhere near the same thing as starting from scratch. It's not that crazy. No, it's not that crazy, but it's a fun prediction for sure. Um, or, or I should say, uh, you know, just pondered speculation. Question. <laughs> speculation. Yeah. Something could happen, but no, this was great. This was fun. Um, even though I didn't think it was going to be fun. Um, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm like bagging on chips and processors. It's okay. You're going to lose uh, your nerd card, dude. You're, you're, I, you were a Linux guy. I know. I know. I just, uh, it got away from me because it got to the point where it got so complex. And then, you know, there's a new processor. It seemed like every year and every six months. And I was just, I just let it all go. I was like, I can't yeah. keep up with this anymore. Um, yeah, it, it, it just, it was if, just too if you're not into gaming, then it doesn't really, it, it doesn't yeah, really and I'm not huge on the radar that, often. that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I play switch, but like, I'm not like huge on the PC gaming. So I'm not like following every release and that kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, but no, I mean, it's interesting. And now I can kind of see these inflection points starting to occur again. So I think we're good. 
Well, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. Um, we post all of our updates as well as video versions of the podcast on YouTube at the X podcast. So please go to YouTube and subscribe to our channel. Also, if you like this podcast, found it interesting or informative, it helps us a great deal if you subscribe or leave a review on whatever platform you use. Thank you all, and we'll see you all next week.